Hello my dear students, I hope you all are doing great. So welcome back to this channel, myself Madhu Yadav, I am a senior lecturer for zoology and in my previous lectures, one of the previous lectures I have discussed the first chapter of ecology that was organisms and population. In today's video, I will be talking about the second chapter of ecology and that is ecosystem. It is a very very small interesting and easy chapter and you know the things given in this chapter you must have already you must have understood all those things in your previous classes in your lower classes okay you know what is a food chain what is a food web what are the living organisms or the biotic components what are abiotic components okay so all these things are going to be very very easy and you can relate all these things to your environment, right? So let us start this chapter without any delay. So we are going to discuss ecosystem. First of all, let us understand the meaning of ecosystem. So it can be a direct question in the NEET exam. What is the functional unit of nature? So functional unit of nature is ecosystem, okay? Functional unit of nature is ecosystem direct question now in this functional unit of ecosystem there will be living organisms and these living organisms they are interacting with the physical environment they are interacting with the soil with the temperature with the rainfall with the light okay so all these are the parts of our physical environment so the in the ecosystem what will be there living organisms will be there and what these living or organisms are doing these living organisms are are interacting with what with the physical environment we are interacting with our nature okay nature is beautiful so yes we are interacting with nature now the entire biosphere the entire biosphere can be considered as a global ecosystem. But in this global ecosystem, because this is a very big global ecosystem, we cannot study it at a time, right? So we have to study the different, different ecosystems present in the whole biosphere. So we can categorize ecosystem on the basis of whether it is present on land or whether it is present in water. Okay, so there can be terrestrial ecosystem and there can be aquatic ecosystems. There are so many things which are present on land and they are existing on land as an ecosystem. For example, a forest, a grassland, a desert, right? They all are different, different types of ecosystems, but they all are present on land. So they all are terrestrial ecosystems. Okay, now some of the terrestrial organisms, uh, some of the terrestrial ecosystems are natural, whereas some can be man-made. For example, if we are making a crop field, if we are growing in our field, we are growing crops, we are growing fruits, vegetables, okay, or any other crop we are growing. So that crop field is a man-made ecosystem that is not naturally made, okay. Now, if we talk about aquatic ecosystem, the ecosystems which are existing in water, for example, pond, river, estuary, wetlands, there can be different, different water bodies where living organisms are interacting with the physical environment. Okay, so if in the water ecosystem is getting, is present, then it is a aquatic ecosystem so ecosystem can be terrestrial ecosystem can be aquatic all these are the examples ecosystem can also be man-made I have given you the example of crop fields this is a aquatic or terrestrial man-made it is a terrestrial man-made whereas an aquarium which we keep in our house okay which we keep in our offices that aquarium we will put water and we'll put so many uh, different different colorful fishes and then it is acting as a aquatic ecosystem but man has made it so it is a man-made ecosystem an aquarium is a man-made 
aquatic ecosystem right so ecosystems can be categorized like this now what is stratification another important term is stratification if you'll go to a forest in the forest there will be big big trees then there will be some shrubs then there will be some herbs then there will be grasses so there is the vertical you know in the vertical manner there is distribution of different species vertically vertical distribution of different species okay the trees will come on the top then the shrubs will come then the herbs will come and then the grasses will come right so this is the vertical distribution of different species occupying different level in the ecosystem for example in a forest trees are present at the top layer shrubs i have given you the example second layer herbs and grasses are present at the bottom layer so what what we have done we have distributed the species according to their presence okay vertical distribution what type of distribution it is vertical distribution so vertical different uh, vertical distribution of different species in the ecosystem will be called as stratification all right now coming to the next point that is components of ecosystem so in the ecosystem what all will take place in the ecosystem we will take an example of a pond and we will see that in a pond there are some producers okay producers are autotrophs they are making their own food they are capturing the sunlight and they are making their own food so you know what are producers right then there will be consumers so so many different types of consumers will be there okay then when the producers and the consumers are dying so when they are dying those will be decomposed by decomposers okay and when producers are eaten by consumers the energy is going from one trophic level to another trophic level i will tell you what is a trophic level when i will discuss food chain so what all is happening in an ecosystem will make the components of ecosystem for example the first one is productivity productivity is an important topic which we are going to discuss first okay so in the productivity we will see that how much amount of biomass is produced by the producers then what is the rate of production of this biomass that is only called as productivity so in a ecosystem obviously one component is productivity second component is decomposition i have told you na all these producers consumers when they will die they will be decomposed so decomposition is another very important process which is you know in detail it is explained in this chapter the third one is energy flow energy flow means from one trophic level to another trophic level then to next trophic level the energy is getting passed okay and this energy is always going in one direction from the sun to producers from pr producers to consumers like that it is flowing so energy flow will be there in an ecosystem and nutrient cycling nutrient cycling means the plants are using the nutrients of the soil and then these nutrients are again going back to the soil when the plant will die again these nutrients will go back to the soil so this is nutrient cycling okay this can occur in water also it can occur on land also okay so now we only have to understand the two components in detail because the other two are removed from the ncert okay so we have to mainly understand what is productivity and what is decomposition okay these are the two main components we have to understand then new energy flow yes energy flow also we have to understand nutrient cycling is not now in the ncert only in the summary the two two three lines are given for the nutrient cycling okay and ecosystem services have also been removed from the ncert so now let us understand in detail the three major components first is productivity second is decomposition and third is energy flow nutrient cycling i have briefed you but it is not in detail it is not given in the ncert we don't have to study this for the neat exam okay so now 
to understand the components in the ecosystem let us take an example of a pond so we are taking the example of a pond and in the pond there will be abiotic component what will be the abiotic component in the pond pond is a aquatic ecosystem so obviously without water pond will not be there so water is the abiotic component then at the bottom there will be soil so soil will be the abiotic component in this water there will be organic and inorganic substances which are dissolved so they are also the abiotic components right so water with dissolved nutrients and soil the solar input solar input means the sunlight which is coming into the pond that is also the abiotic component the temperature the day length all these climatic factors are also the abiotic components if we see the biotic components if we see the biotic components we will see autotrophs we will see heterotrophs consumers and we will see decomposers so in a pond you will find phytoplanktons these are small small organisms they are making their own food they are producers okay you will find algae algae can also do photosynthesis floating submerged and marginal plants so all these plants phytoplanktons algae they are making the producers they are making the autotrophs they are making the biotic component okay coming to the consumers so now there will be zooplanktons which will be eating the phytoplanktons so zooplanktons then some fishes will be there free swimming and bottom dwelling forms will be there some will be freely swimming in the pond some will be present at the bottom and they are consumers okay then when the autotrophs are dying when the consumers are dying then the role of decomposers comes so in a pond you will see fungi will be there bacteria will be there flagellates will be there and they will be helping in the process of decomposition which is a very very important process okay so let us start with the with the understanding of functions of ecosystem i have taken a, an example of pond so in that pond what is happening in that pond the first thing which is happening is done by the autotrophs what these autotrophs are doing they are converting the they are converting the inorganic matter into organic what is inorganic the nutrients present in the soil they are inorganic right and what they are making they are making glucose by the help of photosynthesis by the help of the sunlight okay they are doing the process photosynthesis so photo means light synthesis means what they are forming they are forming organic matter and this is the first thing happening in the ecosystem the second thing is the autotrophs are consumed by heterotrophs because heterotrophs are dependent upon producers heterotrophs are dependent upon others they cannot make their own food okay that is the second point third point i have told you decomposers decomposers will do decomposition and then after that minerals will be released in the soil so that is mineralization okay so decomposition and mineralization takes place and the third thing is i have written a very very important point that is unidirectional movement of energy towards the higher trophic levels very important question how energy flows how energy moves so energy goes in one direction only always okay this can be an important question according to the need point of view so there's always remember unidirectional flow of energy from producers to consumers from consumers to secondary consumers third uh, tertiary consumers like that so all these are heterotrophs okay now coming to the first component of ecosystem that is productivity so let us understand see what is happening if this is a plant plant is getting the sunlight so plant is growing so first of all the plant was small initially the plant was small then the plant is growing so it is increasing its biomass isn't it so the amount of biomass production is primary productivity and that is done by the autotrophs that is done by the producers that is happening due to the 
photosynthesis the process of photosynthesis okay so that is primary production what is primary production amount of organic matter produced by the plants during the process of photosynthesis okay now similarly we can also understand the primary productivity so see production means how much the amount production means amount but when we say productivity means rate okay so production means the amount of biomass produced but productivity means the rate of biomass produced the rate of primary production is primary productivity very very easy to understand what is primary production and what is primary productivity okay so here i have written primary production is the amount it is always the amount not the rate production but when we talk about productivity it is rate of biomass production so when we will write the units of primary production primary productivity don't get confused primary production can be expressed in gram per meter square you can write it like this gram per meter square so here we are taking the area in how much area how much biomass is getting produced by the plants during the process of photosynthesis because it is primary production all right it can be expressed in terms of calories also so it can be expressed in term of kilo calorie per meter square if you are not using per here you can write gram per meter square like this or kilo calorie per meter square like this all right now coming to productivity if we need to express productivity will increase year okay when will in will add one more thing and that is per year so gram per meter square per year or kilo calorie per meter square per year so that is the difference between production and productivity coming to the gross primary productivity we have two types of productivity okay one is gross gross means total okay total that means total uh, the biomass produced by the plants during the process of photosynthesis but is this whole biomass is going to the next trophic level no because plants will also respire right and they will use this energy or this biomass or this organic matter which they are producing they are also going to use it in their respiratory processes right so there will be some loss from the total some loss will be there and then the available biomass is going to the next trophic level is available for the consumers right so if you see here gross primary productivity means rate of production of organic matter during photosynthesis by the process of photosynthesis initially how much biomass has been produced now a considerable amount of gross primary productivity is utilized by plants in respiration so there will be some loss okay and then that's how we calculate net primary productivity so there's a very very important relation between npp and gpp and that can be asked in the question in the neat exam so npp is equal to what gpp minus r r here is respiratory losses okay r here is respiratory losses so npp is equal to gpp minus r now coming to the secondary productivity or secondary productivity or secondary production so first primary production you have seen that it is done by plants okay they are producers they are using sunlight they are making organic matter okay now the same organic matter is used by the consumers so if this plant is there and there is a herbivore now this herbivore is eating the plant okay so herbivore is also going to increase its biomass it is also going to increase its organic matter so here also here also there is some type of production going on and that is called as secondary production or secondary productivity if the amount we are taking production if the rate we are taking rate of secondary production is secondary productivity rate of primary production is primary productivity so now let us discuss the factors upon which productivity depends okay so the very first factor is plant species obviously the plant species will be different different there will be different different plant species 
and that's why their productivity will vary. The next one is variety of environmental factors. So many environmental factors are there, okay, and they are also going to determine the productivity. If they are favoring that plant species, their productivity will be more, right? So the environmental factors, if they are favorable for the plants, then their productivity will be high. Otherwise, productivity will go down. In adverse environmental conditions, productivity will go down, right? The next point is availability of nutrients. Obviously, nutrients are the requirement of the plants. So if there will be less nutrients in the soil, then the plant's productivity will not be that much, right? But if nutrients are very high in the soil, then the productivity will definitely going to increase. So, fourth one is photosynthetic capacity of plants. So, obviously for different different plants, photosynthetic capacity also varies, okay? So, these are the four factors upon which your productivity of the plants will depend. First one is plant species. Second one is, second one is everyone, variety of environmental factors. Third one is the nutrient availability and the fourth one is photosynthetic capacity. So as it is, you can remember these four points upon which the productivity depends. Now let us talk about the productivity of whole biosphere. So this is what you have to remember because it is the data given in NCRT. Okay. So the annual net primary productivity of whole biosphere is how much? 170 billion tons. We are measuring it in dry weight because it is more accurate, right? Now, um, in the whole biosphere, land area is more or oceans are more? Obviously, oceans are covering a large area. 70% of the area of the whole biosphere is covered by oceans. But if you see their productivity out of 170, oceans productivity is only 55 billion tons. What can be the reason behind low productivity of oceans? So, I am discussing the reason also here. See, low productivity of oceans. Why low productivity of oceans is there? This is the question being asked in the NCIT. So, you should know that the nutrient will be less in the ocean. First of all, mainly here you can talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen will be very, very less. And you know nitrogen is very important for the plants, right? So, because of low nutrient content, especially nitrogen and also if you look into the, uh, into the oceans at the deeper level, if you see that much solar energy is not reaching, right? So, less solar energy and less nutrients is the reason behind low productivity of oceans. Whereas, if you see land area is less, but its productivity is more than the oceans, 115 billion tons. So, 115 billion tons is the uh, productivity of land, 55 billion tons is the productivity of oceans. Total productivity of the whole biosphere is 170 billion tons. So, this was all about productivity. Now, we are going to discuss the another component of ecosystem that is decomposition which is a very very important process why because after all all the living matter all the living matter all the living organisms are going to die yes or no so what will happen to the dead and decaying organic matter so this dead and decaying organic matter is called as detritus okay Dead and decaying organic matter is the raw material for decomposition. So that is the process which will occur in total five steps. So let us discuss the details of decomposition, right? So decomposition means breakdown of the breakdown of the complex organic matter, complex, complex organic matter into inorganic substances into inorganic substances what are inorganic substances water carbon dioxide nutrients minerals right they are the inorganic substances whereas the living matter is having organic substance like carbohydrates are there right right so so many 
कार्बन एंड हाइड्रोजन कंपाउंड्स आर देयर इन द बॉडी ओके इन द बॉडी ऑफ लिविंग ऑर्गेनिज्म सो मेनी कार्बन एंड हाइड्रोजन कंटेनिंग कंपाउंड्स आर देयर दे आर द ऑर्गेनिक कंपाउंड्स ऑर्गेनिक मैटर इज देयर नाउ दैट हैज टू बी ब्रोकन डाउन इनटू द सिंपल इन ऑर्गेनिक मॉलिक्यूल्स दैट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ डीकंपोजिशन सो आई हैव ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू व्हाट इज द रॉ मटेरियल फॉर डीकंपोजिशन डेट्राइटस वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट व्हाट इज दिस डेट्राइटस the dead and decaying plant and animal remains the dead and decaying organic matter is detritus so the first process is going to be fragmentation there are total how many processes five processes so you can remember this by fulcum like this you can remember fulcum okay so f for fragmentation l for leaching C for catabolism. The first three processes they will take place simultaneously on the detritus. Okay. After that, what will happen? Humification will happen, and then mineralization will take place. Okay. So let us understand fragmentation. It is very very simple. Fragmentation means simply this is the physical breakdown. There is no chemical breakdown is occurring. Only the bigger parts. are converting into the small small parts and who is going to do that detritivores because they are eating the detritus detritivores like earthworm okay so earthworm is going to break down the large complex organic matter into the small small fragments into the smaller particles now leaching so the small fragments okay after fragmentation during the fragmentation process only some soluble compounds some soluble compounds will go into the soil horizon they will go down into the soil horizon along with the water along with the rain and when they go down they will become precipitated okay and they will become unavailable for the plant use okay so leaching is the process where water soluble inorganic nutrients from this detritus from the small particles of detritus the inorganic nutrients are going down into the soil horizon and precipitate as unavailable salts the third process comes is catabolism so here in the catabolism again breakdown is happening but that is done by bacteria fungi they have the enzymes which will do further breakdown of the detritus so catabolism is break bacterial and fungal enzymes degrade the detritus into simple inorganic substances okay so first three processes are taking place simultaneously on the detritus very very important line written in ncert okay all these are the important lines of ncert if you can remember what i am teaching you can remember the whole ncert whole ecology you can remember okay and you will not miss out on any question from the ncert now coming to the fourth process that is humification so what is humification it is the formation of humus now you should know the characteristics of humus humus is a dark colored amorphous means powdered it is not crystalline it is amorphous highly resistant to microbial action and undergoes decomposition at an extremely slow rate very very important point and since it is colloidal in nature it is the reservoir of nutrients so it is dark it is dark colored it is amorphous it is highly resistant to microbial action and it undergoes decomposition at a very slow rate all right and it is a reservoir of nutrients so many nutrients are there in the humus so humus is formed now once humus is formed from this humus further minerals will be formed and that process is called as mineralization so humus is degraded by the microbes and the inorganic nutrients or minerals are released now they will be available for the use by the plants now again the plants which are growing there 
they are going to use those minerals which are formed by the mineralization. So this is the whole process of decomposition. Okay. So remember all the processes by the help of fulcrum you can remember. So fragmentation, leaching, catabolism occurs simultaneously on detritus. Remember detritus is the raw material. Then occurs humification and mineralization. The process of decomposition we have understood that is going to occur in five steps. Now the whole process requires oxygen. Without oxygen decomposition cannot occur. Okay, If there will be less oxygen or there will be anaerobic condition then the decomposition will get very very slow. All right. So that is very important point decomposition requires oxygen. Now next point is the rate of decomposition. Rate of decomposition depends upon two factors. First factor is the chemical composition of detritus. Detritus is made up of which substances? Okay. So first of all detritus you have to remember and another point is climatic factors. Which climatic factors mostly the temperature we are talking about temperature and moisture. How much moisture content is there in the environment or in the soil. Right. So there is a very very important point if the detritus is rich in lignin and chitin. Lignin and chitin are tough to be broken down. Okay. So that is why the rate of decomposition will be slower. Very very important point. If the detritus is rich in lignin and chitin decomposition rate will be slower. But on the other hand if the detritus is rich in nitrogen and water soluble substances like glucose like sugars right. So then the rate will be very fast. So this is the very important point you have to remember previously the questions have been asked already okay in the NEET exam. So you have to remember lignin and chitin makes the decomposition slow and nitrogen and water soluble substances makes the decomposition fast quicker. Now this is about the chemical composition. Next point is about the climatic factors. So if the temperature, if the temperature is very high, decomposition will be high. Okay. See in when we keep our items in the fridge. So at a low temperature, they will not, they will be preserved, right? They will not be going to be spoiled, right? Now, so warm, warm means high temperature and moist condition. The soil moisture is more here. Okay. There are not dry condition, moist conditions are there. So then it is going to favor the decomposition, favor the decomposition. Whereas on the other hand, low temperature and anaerobiosis, anaerobiosis means less oxygen is there and moisture content is also not there. That is going to inhibit decomposition. Without oxygen, decomposition will not take place. Right. So important points are these four points lignin and chitin rate of decomposition is slow. Okay. Nitrogen and water soluble substances rate of decomposition is fast. Warm condition, moist condition rate of decomposition is going to be high. These conditions are going to favor the decomposition whereas when there will be anaerobiosis or when there will be low temperature it is going to inhibit decomposition. So that is all about decomposition. Now you can see a cycle in the terrestrial ecosystem how the decomposition is going to happen. You can see that from this tree there will be leaf which has fallen down. Now it is the detritus. Okay, The leaf is going to be the detritus and on the detritus only the decomposition will start. So from here you can see an earthworm is doing the fragmentation here. Okay, it is converting the large particles into the smaller particles, right? Then you can see further the fungal enzymes, the bacterial enzymes, they are going to act on the detritus and then further all the nutrients from here also through the leaching, the nutrients are coming into the soil and by the further breakdown of the detritus, the by the catabolism, okay, 
the nutrients are going to come into the soil and ultimately from the humus by the help of the mineralization again the nutrients are going to come into the soil. So now the organic rich soil will be there and it will be used again by the plants. So this is the cycle of decomposition and the reuse of nutrients which are coming into the soil after the process of decomposition right so now decomposition is over the next component the third component we are going to discuss is energy flow so this is going to be very very easy you can easily understand the process of energy flow since you know already that from the producers the energy will go to the consumers okay so this is going to be very very easy but first of all how much energy is coming from the sun is utilized by the plants okay so if we say the if we take the total incident sunlight from that total sunlight not all the sunlight can be used for the process of photosynthesis so that is less than 50 percent less than 50 percent of the total incident solar radiation can be used for the photosynthesis and that is called as photosynthetically active radiation par photosynthetically active radiation so sun is the ultimate source of energy from the sun sunlight is coming now all of that sunlight cannot be used for the photosynthesis so less than 50 percent of it can be used for the photosynthesis but the plants are not using that also they are only using 2 percent of par 2 to 10 percent of par they are only using how much percent of photosynthetically active radiation only 2 to 10 percent okay 2 to 10 percent of the par is used by the plants now the plants there will be unidirectional flow of energy the plants are doing photosynthesis by taking the energy from the sun so from the sun the energy is going to the producers plants they are making the food and then they are eaten by the consumers so the energy is going to the consumers right you can call consumers as heterotrophs also because they are not making their own food and they are dependent upon others for their food requirements right so and obviously another point is no energy is trapped into an organism forever either the either the energy will be passed on or it is lost as heat okay so remember there is unidirectional flow of energy and no energy is trapped in the organism forever it is going to be passed on to the next trophic level or else it will be lost as heat right so we can call consumers the primary consumers will be herbivores because they are they are eating the producers directly so after producers consumers will come now in the consumers there can be primary consumer secondary consumer tertiary consumer all these are heterotrophs okay all these are dependent upon directly or indirectly dependent upon producers or autotrophs right so herbivores for example all these are the herbivores insects uh, birds mammals in the terrestrial ecosystem mollusks in the aquatic ecosystem you will see they are herbivores right they come at the second trophic level then comes the carnivores or you can say them primary carnivores as well okay so carnivores are eating the herbivores then comes secondary carnivores so secondary carnivores are eating the primary carnivores right so all these are the consumers primary consumer secondary consumer tertiary consumer producers are coming at t1 level first trophic level and primary consumers are coming at second secondary are coming at third tertiary are coming at fourth right so you can see this with the help of this figure here this is from ncrt only easily you can understand that this is the first trophic level 
this is the first trophic level where you can see producers are there first trophic level these are the examples of the producers right then primary consumer come at second trophic level they are herbivores secondary consumer are coming at third trophic level that is carnivores tertiary consumers are top carnivores coming at fourth trophic level so from the first to second trophic level energy is passed from second to third and from third to fourth trophic level energy is going to be passed only 10% energy is going to be passed okay that is called as 10% law of energy so from the first to second trophic level 10% energy is going to be passed right just like that further 10% 10% like that all right and here the examples are given in this figure so now this is a very easy figure which you can easily understand now whenever a food chain starts with the living organism it will be called as grazing food chain a grazing food chain a simple grazing food chain you can see here grass is eaten by goat goat is eaten by man if man is eaten by lion so like that okay first trophic level second third fourth mainly four trophic levels will be there or maximum five can be there okay so like this the energy will be passed in the grazing food chain but now when these animals of the grazing food chain are going to die then it is the starting of another food chain that is called as detritus food chain because i have already told you what is detritus detritus is the raw material for decomposition so detritus is formed by the dead plants and dead animals right so here is the starting of detritus food chain and what are the components of detritus food chain the saprotrophs the decomposers the saprotrophs like i have told you fungi bacteria they are feeding upon the dead and decaying matter so that is why they are also called as saprotrophs the another important point is about gfc and dfc if we see in the terrestrial ecosystem okay if we see in the terrestrial ecosystem the much larger fraction of energy is flowing through dfc okay dfc is playing more role than gfc in case of terrestrial ecosystem very very important point questions can come from here but whereas if you see in aquatic ecosystem obviously the flow of energy is done by gfc more more through the gfc than through the dfc gfc is the major conduit conduit means channel gfc is the major channel for the energy flow in the aquatic ecosystem but that is not the case in the terrestrial ecosystem in terrestrial ecosystem your dfc is playing the major role then the gfc dfc is playing the major role in the flow of energy okay as compared to gfc so remember remember this point dfc is greater than gfc in terrestrial ecosystem whereas in aquatic ecosystem gfc is greater than dfc this is for the aquatic ecosystem so there is a difference in the role of gfc and dfc in the different ecosystems and this is directly like this it can be asked in the question and it is given in the ncert now the another point is at some points at some levels the dfc can be connected with the gfc because some organisms of dfc for example earthworm that that is the part of dfc can be eaten by an insect and that insect is a part of gfc okay so some organisms of dfc can be prey to the gfc animals so gfc and dfc can be connected at some points and this interconnection is only going to make the food web and in nature simple food chains does not exist food webs only exist okay because there is this interconnection you know some of the animals are omnivores also 
okay so they are coming at different of trophic levels as well so different food chains can be connected and that's how it is going to make the food web so if somebody will ask you about the humans how would you categorize humans humans are humans are omnivores right they are not only uh, like vegetarian or non vegetarian so humans are mostly like they are both they are omnivores right so they can come at the second trophic level also some of the humans they can come at the third trophic level also they can come at the fourth trophic level also in the different different food chains the human can come at different different trophic levels right the next thing is the trophic level what is the trophic level so this is a place of the organism in the food chain it is a specific place of the organism in the food chain and it is just you know it is a functional level it is a functional level trophic level is representing the functional level not the species as such very important point so trophic level is a functional level okay now the amount of energy going to the higher trophic levels at every trophic level it is going to decrease okay amount of energy decreases at successive trophic levels and when any organism will die that will be converted into detritus so now the energy is going to be the source for decomposers right that energy is the source for decomposers okay so obviously the animals which are at low trophic level they will be having more energy and the animals which are at high trophic level they will be having less energy so there is one term that is standing crop what is the meaning of standing crop so it means that at a particular trophic level how much amount of organic matter is there at a time okay standing crop is the biomass or the organic matter at a particular trophic level at a particular time so we are talking about living matter or non living matter here in the standing crop we are talking about living matter okay there is another term that is standing state in that we are taking the inorganic matter the non living matter present below the soil i mean in the soil not above the soil right but in standing crop we are taking the biomass at a particular trophic level biomass means the organic matter the living matter okay now this is measured in biomass or it can be measured in number in a unit area we can measure the number or we can measure it in biomass as well and i have told you already the transfer of energy follows the 10% law so only 10% of the energy will be going to the higher trophic level so here you can see this is the first trophic level and in the first trophic level the energy from the sun is going to come some of the energy is lost as heat and some of the energy is used by the plants now the plants are eaten by the herbivores they are the primary consumers second trophic level so energy is going here but only 10% energy is going rest is lost as heat here again 10% energy will be going to the third trophic level okay then again 10% energy will be going to the fourth trophic level and from every trophic level if death of organism will occur then it is going to convert into detritus okay so you can see the energy flow through different trophic levels now the last thing is ecological pyramids easy important okay they are easy as well as important also according to the need point of view so we get a pyramid shape when we are when we are representing when we are representing the number biomass or energy relationship between the organisms at different different trophic levels we are going to get a pyramid shape so that is why in the ecosystem when we are seeing the organisms at different different trophic levels and we are counting them or else we are seeing their energy okay or else we are seeing their biomass 
so there can be different different pyramids pyramid of number can be there pyramid of biomass can be there pyramid of energy can be there mostly all the pyramids are mostly upright upright means like this only okay mostly upright because obviously the organisms at first trophic level will be more than the organisms at the next trophic level mostly but exceptions can be there okay so we'll be talking about the exceptions but at the base of pyramid the producers will come at the apex the top level consumers will come the top level consumers will come okay so now in most ecosystems i have already told you that the pyramids of energy pyramid of biomass pyramid of number is going to be upright but exceptions can be there okay and why they are mostly upright because number of producers is greater than the number of herbivores the number of herbivores is greater than the number of carnivores right but let us now talk about the exceptions if we say there is a there is a tree if we say there is a tree so the number of the tree is one only there is a big tree but now in that big tree there are so many insects let us say 100 or 200 insects are there okay so here our our pyramid of number is going to be inverted one tree 100 insects isn't it so it is not upright now okay so that is the exception if they are asking question from the example given uh, like they are giving the example one tree ecosystem okay a tree ecosystem so the pyramid for the tree ecosystem it can will not be upright right it will be inverted it will be inverted so even in the case of c if you see the pyramid of biomass in the c is also generally inverted why why because the biomass of fishes far exceeds than the phytoplanktons phytoplanktons are less phytoplanktons are less less and fishes are more fishes are more and phytoplanktons are less so it is going to be inverted pyramid so exceptions can be there you have to read the question properly what is being asked and then you have to answer okay so mostly the pyramid of energy number and biomass are upright okay if we talk about only the pyramid of energy the pyramid of energy is always upright it is always upright because obviously we have already understood the flow of energy is going to be unidirectional and only 10% energy is going to the higher trophic level right so at a lower trophic level always the energy will be high and a higher trophic level has less energy that is the reason of always upright pyramid of energy energy at a lower trophic level is always more than at a higher trophic level so now you can see the example of the pyramid of number here here you can see the pyramid of number in a grassland ecosystem okay so you can see here nearly 6 million plants are there here at the trophic level 1 at the first trophic level nearly 6 million plants are there but in this ecosystem it can support only 3 top carnivores only 3 top carnivores it can support so this is an upright pyramid this is an upright pyramid isn't it another example is the pyramid of biomass if you see the pyramid of biomass here at lower trophic level there is more dry weight 809 kilograms per meter square is the dry weight at the first trophic level but if you see the biomass at the top trophic level this trophic level fourth trophic level the top carnivore the biomass is less the biomass is only 1.5 kg per meter square this is the biomass obviously number and biomass you know you can relate right so if number will be less biomass will also be less not in every case but mostly 
right? Then you can see the pyramid of biomass in the sea. Here you can see the inverted pyramid. I have talked about this inverted pyramid of biomass. Small standing crop, small standing crop of phytoplanktons here. Only four phytoplanktons, and they are supporting. They are supporting the standing crop of zooplankton. Here phytoplankton. Here zooplankton. See, first of all, phytoplanktons are very very minute organisms. When they are very very small, their biomass will also be very very less. So that is why four. Four is not the number. Sorry, four is not the number. Four is the dry weight. Four kilograms per meter square. Okay, that is the dry weight. That is the biomass. Here, the zooplanktons. If you see, they are more. Then maybe the fishes will be even more. So you will get a inverted pyramid. Okay, this is the inverted pyramid of biomass. You can see. Now coming to the ideal pyramid. This is called as, beta, ideal pyramid. Ideal pyramid because it is always upright. It is ideal pyramid of energy. Okay, here you can see ten thousand joule of energy is there in the first trophic level. Then only ten percent thousand joule. Then hundred joule. Then ten joule. Okay, this is the unit of energy. So the pyramid of energy is going to be always upright. Always upright. This is the ideal. Pyramid, okay. Among all the pyramids, if somebody will ask you which is the ideal pyramid, which can never be inverted, that is the pyramid of energy. Now there are some limitations of the ecological pyramid. We will discuss that also. First of all, I want to discuss the reasons behind the biomass paradox. You have seen inverted pyramid of biomass in the sea. So what is the reason behind that? Okay. Because generally we will say why it is a paradox. Paradox means it is contradictory. One first we are saying that pyramids are always mostly upright, but then in the sea we are saying that it it can be inverted also. So what is this paradox? What can be the reason behind the paradox? The first reason I have already told you that they are minute organisms. If they are very very like small small size organisms. Their biomass is also going to be less. Now another is they reproduce very rapidly, okay, and they grow. So they will be eaten quickly. They are reproducing, but they are even because they are you know uh, above the phytoplanktons. The consumers are so many, so they are eating them. Even though they are reproducing quickly, but still they are being consumed also quickly. So that is why they are not, you know, giving uh, much to the biomass. The third is biomass is constantly being consumed. I have already discussed. I have already told you this that biomass is being consumed quickly, and then biomass is also related with the longevity of an organism. If an organism will be short-lived, it will it will not contribute that much to the biomass. Okay, so they are not that long-lived. They are short-lived. They are short-lived organisms. Whereas when an organism will live long, it will contribute more to the biomass. So these are the reasons behind the biomass paradox. And now let us discuss the ecological pyramids. With this, our chapter will be over. The ecosystem, complete ecosystem, will be over with the limitations of ecological pyramid. So first limitation is. At uh, an organism can come at different trophic levels as well, so it is not counting it twice. It is counting it once only. It does not take account is does not take into account the same species belonging to two or more trophic levels because obviously a species can come at two or more trophic levels. So how does it count? Okay, and It assumes a simple food chain, which does not exist in the nature. Simple food chain does not exist. Only food webs exist. Okay. Next, next is so it does not accommodate a food web. It is not. It is just considering a food chain, which does not exist. 
and is not considering the food web. And the last one is saprotrophs. Saprotrophs are decomposers. They are not given any place in the ecological pyramids. But you know that the saprotrophs are playing an important role, vital role in the process of decomposition. Even in the terrestrial ecosystem, I have told you that the major uh, channel for energy transfer is detritus food chain, not the grazing food chain, right? So, saprotrophs are not included even though they are playing a vital role in the ecosystem. So, all these uh, points are written in NCRT. If you follow the lecture throughout the session, if you have followed, you must have got the important points of NCRT and now you cannot miss out on any question from the NCRT. Okay, so here we are done with the ecosystem. In my next lecture, I will be talking about the third chapter of the ecology, okay, and that is biodiversity and conservation. So, stay tuned for that and if you like the content, if you have understood the lecture, then please give a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. Thank you.